yeah. you're a you're a personal trainer and you work specifically with people with Parkinson's disease. Absolutely. Which Absolutely. which I think is is phenomenal. Um, right. I'm curious, how did you even get into the Parkinson's area in, in fitness? Sure. Well, you know, it, it started uh, quite some time ago, and what had happened was um, I was uh, initially just doing classic personal training, to be quite honest. Um, but um, I had been contacted by someone who heard about me through their physician uh, because physicians were referring folks to me. And uh, the gal that called said, hey, listen, my husband uh, is a now uh, newly retired attorney uh, by virtue of the fact that he has been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Have you ever heard of it? And I said, no, I have not. And she said, well, she said, um, you come highly recommend it. Uh, I hear that you've been working with people for uh, uh, post rehab for orthopedic issues, neck, shoulder, hips, et cetera. She said, and I figured you sound about, you know, you sound about right. So I said, well, sure, I would love to come over and talk to you. And uh, all my um, all of my encounters start with a consultation initially. So I went over and I spoke with him uh, and I was immediately intrigued. Um, so I don't have the traditional story where I have a family member that was impacted, but it was this gentleman who had Parkinson's and it just absolutely intrigued me. And so after speaking with him and going through the normal consultative process, um, I left them and said, listen, I would love to delve into this and look into this more. Um, they agreed and said that sounded fantastic. There was a chemistry there and, um, that's where it really took off. Um, I, dove headfirst into the research uh, with local area doctors, uh, with uh, Hershey Medical Center, uh, with University of Penn, their physical therapy department, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, all these places that I later became networked with, but that I utilized uh, as a way of educating myself about the disease. Hmm. That's so interesting. So they basically sought you out and then you just became a dog with a bone and you just ran with it. Absolutely. I mean, I was, I just couldn't learn enough. I went to symposiums, support groups, anything that you could possibly uh, find uh, back then <laughs> uh, and, and get that kind of information. And so, yeah, I was really intrigued by that. And so I, I, I coined it as I took personal training into the, into the medical community and then more specifically took a right turn into the Parkinson's community. And that's where I reside. That's phenomenal. That's fine. And you mentioned Hershey is used to used to live up in the Harrisburg area. Now you're in Arizona. Which part of Arizona are you in? Yeah, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, so just about 15 minutes outside of Scottsdale. So it's considered uh, the Valley of the Sun area. Yeah, I, I, very, very pretty area. I was there once a few years ago. I'm, yeah. I'm curious, um, is, is there a difference in Parkinson's patients, maybe the prevalence, um, say in Pennsylvania? where it's cold right now versus, you know, uh, in, in Phoenix, where I know it's not very hot, not very cold right now. Is, is temperature play a role in this? Is there more, more Parkinson's in one part of the country? Though? Like, for instance, with people with MS, we see more multiple sclerosis in the northern states than we do in the southern states. Is there anything like that with Parkinson's? Absolutely. Uh, they are seeing the same thing, ironically. Um, two parts of that question. One, with the uh, climate, climate certainly has its impact. Uh, when it's cold outside, it does tend to really kind of illuminate some of those symptoms that a lot of the Parkinsonians have. Uh, so cold weather is particularly challenging. Uh, some are sensitive even to heat, um, but from uh, my experience, it seems as though the cold is particularly tough. Uh, as far as areas, yes, they are saying that uh, areas such as Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York are some of the hot spot areas where they're seeing a, uh, a particular uh, demographic that shows that it's more prevalent in those areas. Uh, we're also seeing it a little bit in uh, Denver, Colorado and some areas around there. So uh, it's quite interesting. Um, and this leads to the whole uh, idea that perhaps there's an environmental thing going on here. Uh, and so there's a lot of research uh, other than just genetics, looking into that. Have they uncovered any kind of environmental toxins that may be more prevalent in some areas than others where, where Parkinson's is more prevalent? From what I understand, they have. Um, it, I thought it was interesting. There was a study uh, that was done some time ago, and I believe it was uh, the Camp Lejeune study, and they were showing that um, some exposure to some toxins that they found in water uh, and some other, some other things were particularly uh, 
at play here. So one thing I found interesting was when I first began working uh, with folks with Parkinson's, I scratched my head for a second and I said, you know, it seems like I have an awful lot of attorneys and accountants that seem to have Parkinson's. What could the connection be? And of course, back then at that time, everyone said, well, you know, I don't know, but, you know, this is what we're seeing. And so I wasn't sure if it was indigenous to the region or the area or to the occupation. But what they found also in that study is, is that some of the things that are used uh, in dry cleaners, so to actually dry clean clothes, the PCBs and things like that, are actually causing uh, Parkinson's from what I understand, according to that study. Um, also, they find that for uh, people that get their nails manicured, uh, the, the, uh, the solvent that's used to remove the nail polish uh, has been linked uh, to potentially being a cause of Parkinson's. So I found it interesting. And of course, your attorneys, your accountants, so and so forth. It's a lot of what they do. That's a staple, you know, with the, those two things. Um, but they're finding things such as that uh, to be linked to uh, the onset of Parkinson's. Uh, and as far as environmentally, I believe they're finding certain pesticides and things in the soil that could potentially show a link to uh, the cause of Parkinson's. Hmm. That's really, really interesting. I, I had never heard that before. Is there, and this is probably off topic, but it, are there any supplements that some people with Parkinson's might be taking? Sure. Yeah. You know, um, of course, everyone wants to, you know, explore supplementation. Um, there are none as of yet that are recognized by credible sources as being a supplement to go to. Uh, in fact, I would venture to say that those with Parkinson's should be even more careful looking at a uh, supplement, especially due to the fact that most of them are taking some sort of medication, obviously, for the Parkinson's condition. Uh, I had once worked with a retired nurse uh, who was on an antidepressant and was also taking St. John's wort. Not a good combination, causing a, causing issues, as you can imagine. Uh, so they really, really need to be uh, cognizant, uh, especially uh, because they're finding interesting research to show that there are certain foods that are helping uh, impact uh, things like dopamine levels. So you have to really be careful, and it's always a, a navigation of, of, uh, of an experience, if you will, with the drugs that they need to take, the on time, the off time, how much they need to take, if it's progressing, if it's not, those sort of things. Right. Yeah, I, the St. John's Water, I'm, I'm not surprised. It, uh, it's, it's one of those supplements that has its, its uh, share of clinical research, but it also appears to have more side effects than you can shake a stick at. Uh, right. e even, even birth control pills yeah. uh, it interfere with birth control pills. And, uh, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's something I think a lot of people are not aware of. Um, you mentioned foods. What foods might someone with Parkinson's want to stay clear of? Well, uh, you know, it's interesting. What I find is that most people with Parkinson's, usually there's something else going on as well. I've rarely ever seen anyone that has Parkinson's not have an issue where they're also battling something else. Parkinson's and Graves disease or Parkinson's and fill in the blank. There's usually something else going on. Um, so it is very individualized. Parkinson's is affecting each person differently. Therefore, they're calling it the snowflake disease. Um, but as far as um, foods that they should avoid, uh, oftentimes, you know, constipation is one of the side effects of Parkinson's. And so obviously, it goes from there. You look at some of the common side effects and then you advise, their doctors will advise accordingly of some foods that they may want to uh, avoid, uh, especially when taking medicines. In fact, the biggest debate is uh, and continues to be, what should I take or what foods should I consume when I am taking my meds for Parkinson's? Because there's a big debate on, do I take in protein? How much protein? What source of protein do I take in? Uh, and, and the debate continues to go on with uh, what that should and shouldn't be. So for some, in some instances, we're saying, hey, look, um, really, really just kind of ease back on fava beans um, because of the side effects that they believe that that has, um, where you know, it, it can have a negative impact in addition to some of the medications they may be taking. So people with Parkinson's, they should be on a special diet that's not necessarily high in protein? Am I hearing you correctly on that? Uh, I don't know that they should be on a special diet, but they should be very cognizant of 
uh, what they're eating and and uh, and certainly how much. Knowing that constipation is a side effect anyway, it's very important, as you can imagine, uh, to be mindful of, of what they're consuming. So uh, I wouldn't say special diet as much as I would say um, really doing a good job of paying attention um, doing some of the basics that we all know about, you know, getting, you know, staying well hydrated, uh, getting enough water, those sort of things. You mentioned that Parkinson's sometimes go hand to hand with other conditions. And I neglected to bring this up in the beginning, but for those of us who are saying, what the heck is Parkinson's? Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disease. Um, and this is happening uh, in the area called the substantia nigra, uh, where the dopamine levels are. Uh, the dopamine levels, uh, tend to decrease, uh, even deplete. And so for that situation, that is what's causing a lot of the side effects of Parkinson's. Um, and so that is really, and it's a, it's a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, so it's progressive in nature. Um, and that's where exercise and of course the meds come into play to help manage and try and slow that down. Right now there's no reversing it, but you know, we're certainly trying to slow it down. So it is a neurodegenerative disease. Um, there's a primary unit, uh, in the brain, um, the brain cell will go the neuron, which is, you know, those, that's the area that's infected. And so it's causing issues with movement. Um, it's causing both motor and non-motor, uh, symptoms in the folks that have it. I tell my folks all the time, you know, when you're out in public, uh, even now, even though we have a face to the disease, so to speak, and looking at the likes of Michael J. Fox, et cetera, most folks still aren't sure what they're seeing or what they're looking at. Um, and because it does vary so much, they just know most of the time they see someone that's perhaps having an issue or a struggle. Uh, but because of the varied side effects of the condition, you may not understand what's going on with someone uh, when you see them in a the store. Is there an age where Parkinson's becomes more common, younger people, older folks, etc.? Yeah, they actually have broken this into two categories. Um, we see the onset of Parkinson's happening most popularly about age 60 plus. Uh, but there is young onset Parkinson's disease, such as what Michael J. Fox encountered. And young onset Parkinson's disease is um, thought to start at age 40 to 50 is where they consider that to be young onset. Hmm. Yeah. And, and they haven't figured out a cause of this, obviously. Some, maybe something in the environment, maybe some toxin or... Just are they, I, I or possibly that. genetics? <laughs> yeah, there, there's uh, the nice part is, is there's a lot, a lot of, of um, there's a lot of activity in the form of studies and things like that right now, and uh, that continues to really pick up. So, there's a, a lot going on, and a huge credit to the Michael J. Fox Foundation because they're really doing a lot of studies and, and things like that. And uh, there are different sites that folks can go to to even look at it and participate in studies. So, uh, so much is going on looking at the cause, looking at therapies, um, right. looking at medicines. Uh, things are constantly evolving. Moving on to the exercise aspect of things, you, you know, you're, you're a personal trainer. You've been doing this for, gosh, I'm going to guess close to 20 years. Um, how, in, how does exercise help uh, people with Parkinson's? Sure. So uh, exercise is he, exercise is now being touted as, you know, the the so to speak, the pill that should be in with the rest of them in the pill box. <laughs> uh, it is that uh, impactful. Uh, and so Parkinson's has been shown to slow the neurodegenerative process down. Um, and so for a disease that's progressive, that's huge to be able to find something that can either slow it down or in some cases, we're seeing it specifically linked to improving, uh, in a positive way, some of, the, some of the side effects that we see from Parkinson's. And so it becomes terribly important to not only emphasize the whole mantra to move, but now to move um, with purpose. And so it addresses those motor and non-motor skills. Uh, it continues to either help them sharpen uh, or remain, uh, because if you don't use it, you lose it. We know that. Uh, but exercise has been shown to uh, have just such a, an incredible impact. There are studies uh, that have been done uh, that have shown uh, the impact. Uh, for instance, I believe there was one by uh, a Dr. J. Alexander, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and it was all about forced intensity exercise. 
And so the study was uh, done with a tandem bike. And so you have someone on the front of the bike riding and riding at a speed that, of course, the person on back wouldn't normally keep up with. Uh, and through that study, what they found was when the person got off of the bike, um, for instance, the side effect of, of handwriting, usually they have, um, it micronizes their handwriting isn't, isn't any good and, and, and they can't even write legibly. And they found that there was an instant uh, benefit right there. You know, they were able to write and their, their writing was a lot better. Um, and some of their other symptoms uh, had improved right away. So they're finding that through things like uh, low intensity, high intensity, um, there are many benefits, uh, as well as where this condition starts in the brain. Uh, so they, there are neuroprotective benefits. Um, there, are, uh, neuropl neuroplasticity is another benefit. So exercise really, really has a place uh, in the Parkinson's community. Uh, we just simply need more fitness professionals to uh, to arrive <laughs> and help. It, it's interesting you mentioned the cycling because once we talked about coming on the podcast, <laughs> yeah. I started seeing videos uh, on uh, on Parkinson's popping up in my YouTube feed. Is that and, right? <laughs> yeah, which is proof that our phones are listening to us. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the, the one that jumped out at me the most was a video of a man with really bad Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. They put him on a, a, a bicycle and he <laughs> rode around a parking lot and he literally hopped off the bike like there was no problem. Absolutely. It was impressive to watch. And if, if nobody's seen this video before, just go on and go on YouTube or wherever technology yeah. or and just look yeah. up Parkinson's and bicycle. You'll see the video. Yeah. Yeah. It's impressive. This man could barely stand. They put him on a bike, and in a few in a few minutes, he didn't have any symptoms. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing to see. Um, yeah, and, and like you said, folks can, you know, they can pop on and find these different things. Um, Davis Finney, you know, another great place to go and look uh, and to even hear his story. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the benefits of exercise, it's real. It's real. Uh, the folks I work with, uh, I love it. They always say, um, which I, I, I swear I should have written somewhere, uh, I don't know how people don't exercise because they see the impact and the difference. Uh, so that video is is real. <laughs> and, and this effect of of exercise, again, with cycling, it seems to have a global effect on Parkinson's right. symptoms. So you even mentioned the handwriting gets better, which you, you would think that it would only be the legs that would improve, but no, even the upper body is improving right. as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's more than, you know, it, it, it it's more than just you know, it's small things, you know, everyone thinks, well, of course, they're going to say exercise and here comes the exercise guy. And of course, he's going to say you should exercise and it'll improve your mood. Um, look, that's just one on a list of things. Uh, and for a condition like this, that, that essentially never stops. Um, one of my clients said that one time, and I thought that was particularly powerful. Uh, it was years ago uh, when the stock market was ready to crash. And uh, the news stopped by and, you know, they said, you know, we find this interesting, ma'am, you know, well, why are you continuing to exercise? And, you know, with finances and everything. And she looked right at the camera and she said, you know what? Parkinson's doesn't know anything about the economy and it never stops. It doesn't take a break. It doesn't honor holidays. It's all the time every day of my life. And so I have to find things that I can do that help me, quote unquote, fight the good fight. And um, now exercise has really gained momentum because it's been studied more. And so now there's a greater understanding of what the impact is here. Um, and I think that that really started to take off with, um, uh, with the boxing program, Rock Steady, that, that got popular there. I think that also helped shine uh, the light on exercise. Um, not that boxing is the sole exercise that's good for Parkinson's, but it gave an example uh, and so when folks ask me about it, I'll tell them, you know, why it's beneficial and, you know, why you should try that and, and how it could help. Uh, it's not that you have to do it. There are plenty of other exercises, but it's another exercise that demonstrates the benefits of exercise. Yeah, I've, I've seen videos of people in a group exercise class and they're beating on an exercise ball with like drumsticks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so interesting. How do we do we know a how long this uh, ameliorative effect of exercise has 
on on Parkinson's? How long does it as the does it subside the symptoms? And do we know an optimal dose of exercise that may benefit people the best? Great question. So as far as how long exercise lasts, I think that kind of coincides with the recommendation. And you'll find the uh, Parkinson's Disease Foundation will will tell you that, you know, exercising, they want to see folks get about 150 minutes worth of exercise a week. Um, So when you break it down between things like cardiovascular activity, um, you know, things that are aerobic, obviously, and then even non-aerobic, it really breaks down to folks exercising probably about five, six days a week. Uh, because the idea is to is to move not constantly every second, but to move and move productively, frequently, uh, because that's what helps. And the reason for that is because unfortunately we can't point to any one exercise or exercise program that you can do and say, you know what, I think you're good for a few weeks or you're good for a few months. Um, it doesn't stay. However, the interesting thing I've seen is that when we get folks exercising and exercising on a regular basis there seems to be a certain level of quality that we've installed. And now we're looking at maintaining that quality, which is very attractive because it is better than if they were just sitting and allowing the effects and the disease to play to them. Like I say to my folks, don't just let Parkinson's happen to you, happen back to Parkinson's, you know, and do this by moving. You you need to move. (laughs) If somebody starts to exercise, say today with Parkinson's, and say they're doing like, they start out with like 10 minutes of some exercise Mm -hmm. and and their Parkinson's symptoms improve, how long might they see the improvement? 10 minutes, a half an hour, an hour, or or will that vary from person to person? Yeah, that'll vary from person to person, no question, Um, if for no other reason, because the way that each person is experiencing Parkinson's is different. And so for that, it's why we have to say, you know, I can't tell you that it'll benefit that that the benefits will arrive and stay like they do for this person versus the other person uh, so much comes into play um, the person's background prior to prior to that diagnosis um, uh, their medical history you know injuries uh, so many different things but if nothing else the condition itself just being so individualized certainly makes a difference is there any data on the length of time someone exercises? As In other words, if someone exercises, say, three months, six months, a year, do they have a more profound, does that physical activity have more profound effect on reducing Parkinson's symptoms for a longer time than if someone only just starts it in, you know, for a couple of weeks and like, ah, it's not really working so well? It, it, does, does it build up over time is what I'm asking, and you get a better, bigger benefit the longer you do it? Yeah. I don't know if there is hard data out there that supports that. Uh, I would like to think there is because over the 20 plus years that I've been doing this, I have certainly seen uh, the benefit of reaching what I call a stalemate. So in other words, here's Parkinson's and the folk and the, and the person that has it. We've introduced exercise and the variety, which is very important in some other aspects of exercise. And we've seen uh, a situation where you know they don't seem to have symptoms progressing and they don't seem to you know, f- find conditions getting worse. If anything, uh, majority of the folks I work with, we actually find that they get better. Now, I'm not saying that they're starting to conquer Parkinson's, but they're getting a strong hold on the condition from the standpoint of their symptomology and they're seeming to have a better time of it, managing it better. Um, for instance, there's a person that, uh, that started coming to me, I'd say probably just about a year ago now. And, uh, initially she was attending a class or two. Uh, uh, the class was very good, but it was just a class or two. And now, uh, with us getting together and a one-on-one approach, a variety of exercises, and more importantly, as I tell all the folks, consistency, well, it's, it's, it's interesting. It seems like she's surrounded the wagons, you know, if you will. And, you know, we know what's at stake here. We know what the symptoms are, but she just doesn't seem to have the same, uh, the same issues. Her quality of life, I guess is what I'm saying, is so much better, even with the conditions at hand. Um, and that is what I hear most of the time and becomes one of the most worthwhile results that we can hope for at this point. So interesting. And you mentioned boxing, you mentioned cycling. So am I correct in assuming there's no one perfect mode or type of exercise for someone to do who has Parkinson's? Swimming, I would imagine, might work as well? 
Yeah, you know, I, I would say to answer that best, we know that any exercise that, well, not any exercise, but exercises that promote large movements are things that we're very much a big fan of. So, um, you know, so that that's why there's programs like LSBT Big and Loud. They're all exercise programs that really focus on large movements because the condition Parkinson's uh, simply wants to just bring everything into a really small box. It wants to wants people to stoop down and curl in. Uh, it certainly wants to soften their voice. It wants them to kind of start to curl in. And so we want large movements that open it up, go against that grain, and really make a positive impact. So for that, that allows us to kind of get back to the basics of exercise, which is, hey, listen, we know exercise is good, but you actually have some choices here. Do you enjoy swimming? If you enjoy swimming, then sure would love to see you swim and use those, those large, large movements. Uh, if it's yoga or Tai Chi, okay, that's fantastic. Boxing is, is a great program. Uh, strength training and resistance training, functional exercise. A lot of these things are all very beneficial. Um, it's just, you know, the instruction is what's key. Uh, at safety, obviously, when it's being performed. But all these things make a big difference, and they're all particularly good, as long as they satisfy the underlying premise, which is we want large movements. Uh, we want things that help with balance, range of motion, things like that. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I often uh, talk about the benefits of big muscle group exercises as well, compound multi-joint <laughs> exercises. In the gym, and you've seen it as well, people tend to focus on like one, mostly one thing. It's like biceps. You right. Know? <laughs> exactly. Or, or these days as women, it's glutes. <laughs> I yeah. see that on the gym too. Yeah. And, yeah, but especially biceps. I, I mean, there's more, more than the, the biceps to the body. And that's right. Um, well, we don't live in a in a in a, in a uni joint world. We live in a multi joint world. We're walking up steps, walking down steps. You know, getting out of yep. a chair, getting off the floor, gardening is use a yep. tremendous amount of muscle. At the same time, and the neural recruitment is greater for bigger right. muscle groups, and that makes sense that it would benefit Parkinson's the most. You're using more of your brain to use these big right. muscles. Yeah, you know, there. I mean, and to me, it's it, it's paramount at that point, especially for this population. We cannot afford to just say, you know what, like you said, let's do your biceps. We need so much more than that. Uh, it's okay to sprinkle that in, but you know, essentially, we need exercise. I even explain it from a standpoint of, you know, some of the benefits of exercise is, is its rhythmic effect. You know, like with the boxing, you know, jab, jab, punch, jab, jab, punch. We need that from, you know. <laughs> other standpoints other than just the physicality of it. So, um, yeah, it, it's, that's really where it's at. And, and, and I'm just glad to see that, um, exercise is being introduced in that fashion in the Parkinson's community rather than the other. I mean, you know, another big thing is they talk about dancing for Parkinson's exactly because it's rhythmic, you know, and anything that causes the person to have to think about it, execute it, and then perform the movement re repetitively is a great recipe for exercise. Okay. Rhythmic exercise, rep repetition, multi-joint. Right. It, it, it all makes sense. It, yeah. It definitely makes sense. Um, it, when somebody begins an exercise program with you for Parkinson's, what is a typical length of time that you might start with? Uh, an, an hour or less? Or does it vary from person to person? Sure. Yeah. You know, I work with folks one on one. I don't believe in doing classes or groups. Um, nothing against that approach for, for those that are so inclined, because if that's what encourages it to move, uh, fantastic. But I work with folks one on one. Uh, the sessions are always 60 minutes in length. And the reason being is that um, they're very customized. And what I mean by that is it's not just through exercise selection but based on how the person is feeling when they come in. So, um, you know, we advise that folks, you know, try to embark on exercise when they're at their peak uh, medicinally. So in other words, they take their dose and about 45 minutes later or so, that's the most advantageous time for them to get into exercise. But still, again, sometimes people will arrive and it's not a good day or they're just having difficulty or whatever the case may be. And so therefore, there's the exercise program, and that may not necessarily always be the full complement of movement type exercises. It may adapt. It may you know be adapted into now. It's more stretching while they're there, 
or we may work on more of the cognitive things while they're there, or we may work on things having to do with the hands uh, or anything like that. So it's interesting, you know, the things that, that we're doing, um, it, it, you have to be able to, we call it check down. You have to be able to check down. When the person arrives, you have a plan, but you have to be able to instantly adapt that plan to fit them when they arrive so that they still derive the, the most benefit from uh, making the visit. But that in and of itself is why an hour still is sufficient because there's still plenty that we can do even if they're not up for a traditional type of exercise movement. Since we are dealing with a neurogenitive disorder, I'm, I'm thinking about a, a gentleman I worked with several years ago, who, again, who had multiple sclerosis. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that, well, a couple things jumped out at me at that was that uh, with, with MS, um, it's one of those things where heat makes it worse. And so Absolutely. I remember... I remember it being, you know, in the summertime, like 95, 98 degrees out. But when I went into his house, um, it was like 50. He had the air conditioner on constantly. So I literally went into his house wearing a coat. And, right. <laughs> um, right. But the, the other thing was is that I had to repeat myself sometimes yes. because he would forget what we had done. Right. Um, do you find that same issue with Parkinson's where their thinking or memory gets a little fuzzy? Depending on what stage the, the the person is at, it can definitely be an issue for sure. Uh, or depending on how the disease is impacting them, it may be more of an issue for them than for others. And also certainly as it progresses, it's a sign that perhaps that's becoming an issue. So uh, whether it's an issue or not, I build that into all my programs. I call it multitasking. So I'll ask someone to make sure that they are you know, performing at least three tasks within an exercise. So, you know, they may be, you know, marching in place, um, but they also have to maybe be, you know, moving their arms at the same time. And I also want them to count or I want them to tell me something, you know, I mean, it's very planned. It's not random, but so we're, we're always looking, I'm always looking at the multitasking aspect. Uh, one, to keep that sharp. Two, to work on it if need be. And three, to preserve it if it's not an issue, uh, because it can. Um, I had a gentleman that I was working with and a uh, perfect example where you could tell that the condition had progressed because I, you know, I said, okay, what I need you to do is I need you to curl your right, then your left, and then both. And after just two reps, he stopped and said, what do you want me to do? What, what are you trying to say? And got very flustered, which is common, and said, you know, I, and then that was it. It's not a matter of pick up where you left off from. Uh, he was flustered to the point where, you know, that was it for that exercise. So it can be that way. Um, and so the, the instruction is, is, is very important. We call it cueing. And so we're always cueing. And even if someone isn't having difficulty, I'm cueing and I'm watching the execution of it. You know, say, okay, you know, this is what we need. We need you to perform this, this way. Make sure you're lifting your feet. Strike with your heel. Push off with your toe. Get the proper, proper gait stride. Make sure you're moving your arms. We know the arms don't want to swing. So we're cueing them, watching. And even though I'm mentioning what to do, they still have to receive that message. And then they need to perform that action. So I'm looking at that as well to see, are you, are you able to do that? How's that going? What's the quality of it? How are you managing that? And I'm glad you brought that up because I, I know there's various personal trainers and other fitness professionals watching us right now or listening to us on the podcast. Yeah. And if they are working with people with Parkinson's, they have to monitor the person regularly, but also repeat themselves and realize that individual may get frustrated with what they're doing. And the personal trainer needs to be aware of that if it doesn't happen, correct? Absolutely. Um, the, the responsibility of, of a personal trainer in this situation uh, is certainly what I would consider more weighted. Um, you really have to understand what you're looking at. You have to have a pretty keen sense of what you're looking for. Um, definitely adaptability is, is very key. Uh, and, um, of course, a passion for working with the population. But, you know, we are considered the eyes and ears of, uh, of, of, the, of the physicians, 
uh, a physical therapist when they're discharged from therapy. In other words, we're kind of like the free safety in football. We're the last line to make sure that doesn't get behind us. So, you know, there have been plenty of times where I've said, hey, listen, um, uh, I had a situation with a gentleman and I said, you know what, I can tell you right now, I said, um, he's starting to exhibit uh, you know, issues of, of excessive saliva, a little bit of drool, that's new, that wasn't happening. Um, but, you know, when we looked at it, it was really looking at it. Is it just because his head is down and it's his position of his head? Or is he really starting to have one of those side effects and that's new? If it is, it is inherently my responsibility to say something to the family members or the caregiver or whomever or even stop the program depending on what's going on and say, listen, I really need you to get that checked. We want to make sure that you're still in the best possible position you can be in while managing this disease. So there's some responsibility there. Um, um, I've talked to some trainers and I've had some say, you know what, too much for me. You know, I, I don't want to get into all that. I understand that respectfully. But for those that do, the biggest difference, Joe, is that now there are educational opportunities out there for personal trainers that didn't exist before. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, a place called medfit.org. Fantastic. They have a special, they have a certification just for fitness professionals that want to work with those that have Parkinson's. Fantastic. Uh, it's, it's, it's in depth, the course, but it should be. Is you've worked with a lot of people over the years. Is there one person you've worked with that has been a standout? Where you're like, wow, this person made phenomenal improvements. You know there is, uh, and it's actually just recently, <laughs> uh, just a year ago. There is a gentleman that comes. Uh, his daughter uh, had reached out, and she said, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm I'm desperate here. I'm looking for something for my dad. You know, he's he's got a lot of things going on here, and he is almost in a wheelchair and just not much in the way of quality of life. And she said, I'm going to be very honest with you. You know, he kind of wants to give up. And she said, I, I really want to try and find something for him. And I, I went to, you know, I found you on the internet, you know, and I, I saw your, your, your landing page there. And, and I'm just hoping maybe this, this could be it for us. And long story short, uh, this gentleman now walks in here with no cane uh, and is just doing phenomenal. Um, it motivates me just to be part of that. Um, it makes my eyes glassy. <laughs> it's just amazing uh, that the strides that this this gentleman has made, and it has just absolutely turned his life around. And so, um, for those that wonder, you know, is there ever a profound impact? Yes, there is. Um, and I had some profound impacts with other folks before, or I should say, was a part of. Um, but this one has really, really been uh, phenomenal, uh, and. Uh, so, yeah, he, he, they, they wrote a really nice testimonial that kind of really outlines it. Um, and I asked them to write it not, not to celebrate my, my praises, but to encourage other folks that are out there that are thinking, ah, you know, this exercise really going to make a difference because this guy is a shining example of that. Wow. He was in a wheelchair and now he's walking without a cane. Without a cane. It's amazing. I, I just... You know, it's one of those, Joe, where you, you, you almost have to see it to believe it. Um, but it is just amazing. I, I remember the day he arrived and it, it's just, I remember when he came, to, came in for a session and he didn't have a cane and I was looking around and behind him. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> and um, he said, I'm feeling good. That's what I'm doing. He said, I, I came in to exercise and his daughter comes with him each and every time she drives him. Um, and I watched and, you know, and I, I'm right there with him. And, you know, I mean, I certainly wouldn't recommend someone walking on their own. That's usually just the opposite, um, if need be. But uh, this gentleman, you know, literally has improved. Um, it's just incredible. And, and it's, you know, we count it as obviously giving it a chance, you know, number one. But number two has been the consistency. Now, I only see this gentleman uh, twice a week. So, you know, but he's exercising at home. So he's taken the reins and, you know, I gave him things I'd like to see him do at home. And to his full credit, he does them at home. So he's adhering to that frequency of exercise uh, and then gets the additional what he needs when he comes here. You you sounds like you basically saved his life. You know, uh, it feels that way. Um because to know where he was 
uh, emotionally, um, physically, um, we are such a long way from where that was. Um, and I am just, just honored and blessed to be a part of that. And I just, um, yeah, I barely have words for it other than this is fantastic. Yeah, no, it really is. A- exercise is definitely medicine. And I, and we live in a country where a lot of people don't want to exercise. Why we can't find right. the time and all that jazz. Um, right. But, you know, it is something we're able to do. And when we cannot do it, that's, we take it for granted. And yeah. um, the yeah. lack of ability to do your daily activities can weigh heavily on us emotionally, uh, psychologically, and um, you've you've not only improved as, as Parkinson's, but also his mental outlook as well, which is go yeah. hand in hand with improving the total overall global quality of his life. That's um, that's phenomenal. Sure. That's yeah, phenomenal. I mean, you know, most folks will tell you, you know, I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to feel like a burden. So here's how you lift it. You know, uh, get yourself active and, you know, find out what you can do. I'm not I'm not saying that you're going to be able to, you know, stand up and paint houses. But what I'm saying is, is that there's something to be said when you are at your peak, when you're doing the most you can do, because you're the best you can be with the resources you have, with the energy you have, and with the abilities that you have. That's far different than someone who doesn't try and just says, well, you know, I have this condition and I'm just one of the million people in the United States living with it. And what can I do? Um, there is something you can do. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, for those personal trainers watching us right now and are thinking, wow, this is great. Are there any modifications that uh, that either a, an individual should use to do themselves or maybe a personal trainer who's maybe working at a gym uh, and thinking about, oh, what can I do to help people with Parkinson's? Is there any modifications to different exercises that maybe they might want to think about doing? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say, you know, the modifications arise out of understanding the condition and the side effects. And so there's a natural, um, there, there's just a natural occurrence of understanding if you're really proficient of what those adaptations need to be. So if you have someone that's not well balanced on their feet, obviously there's going to be some adaptations. It could be sitting and doing the exercise. It might be standing, but then where you have them standing or if you're using a gait belt or whatever have you. So there are ways to do different exercises without forcing them to be done, but there are adaptations that can be made. Majority of my folks, because of the stage that they're in right now, they're in early stages, they're able to get on the bike. But just little things like the uh, recumbent bike we have here, you don't have the bar where you have to step over it. It's a step through. So it's the thoughtful things such as that, that you're thinking of. And, you know, when they're going to do a seated row exercise, I have a very firm uh, styrofoam cushion under them because for some folks to sit that low and stand back up is just, is just a bit much, Uh, or it's just too much hip loading. They're going down too low and they already have issues of balance. So these are examples of adaptations that you may want to make. And for the trainers out there that may be interested don't feel overwhelmed and thinking, oh my gosh, I'll never know what they are. What we're doing is you're taking it person by person, you know, session by session, day by day. And as you combine that with the knowledge you have of the condition and the side effects, more specifically that particular individual side effects, then you begin to put together something very custom for just that person. Uh, and, and what they need. You know, the gentleman that walks through the door now that doesn't need a cane um, isn't quite like the person who has freezing episodes. That's different. I'll never recommend that they walk without a cane. Uh, and certainly, you know, we've got other things in play that make a difference for their exercise experience. Wow. Yeah, I would think as we're talking two two devices in mo- many gyms I've seen over the years that may lend some help would be the upper body ergometer. Sometimes they call it the arm bike. Where you Absolutely. And, yeah. And I also see another uh, type of a, a bike in, it's not really a bike, it's called the New Step. I think that's probably the company that makes it. It reminds Absolutely. me of a seated elliptical almost. I think that machine, both of those are phenomenal, but I, I they're both muscle group exercises, especially the New Step. Um, yeah. I would think they would do very well with somebody with Parkinson's. I. Yeah. So if someone works at a gym, you know, and, and they have, um, you know, they have access to this kind of equipment. Absolutely. You know, you bring up a good point. These are things that may be particularly 
beneficial for that person. Um, you know, just whenever approaching a piece of equipment, just understand, you know, understand the person that's with you. Uh, obviously, make sure that you have the education or, or get it uh, from someone to, to find out how to ha- help that person navigate, you know, depending on how dependent they are. Uh, on someone else for balance or whatever have you, um, just understand that so that you can get them on safely and get them off safely because anxiety is one of the side effects of Parkinson's. It's easily roused, uh, not to their, uh, not not to their, you know, to their approval. Uh, but uh, so so you want to make it, you know, where they feel both confident and comfortable with what what they're doing and, and that it's safe. Uh, so just you know, just understand where it's at and what you're doing and, and some of the, some of the, some of the things that are going on um, and and particularly how it's affecting that person. Can't emphasize that enough. You know, one person may be very, uh, very rattled because, you know, there's loud music and there's a lot of things going and that just doesn't work for them versus the other person might say, that's great. Love the music choice. That's fantastic. What are we doing? (laughs) You bring up a good point. Some gyms can be kind of intimidating. Um, people dropping weights on the floor and the floor shaking and people yelling and screaming and not all gyms, but I've been in some. I'm sure you have right. been. Yeah. I mean, I'm a little intimidated to go in myself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and you, you mentioned uh, freezing episodes and even anxiety among some people who may be, you know, be, just because of Parkinson's, but also maybe even in a gym environment. Um, yeah. Is, is, are there any thing, any other things that maybe a personal trainer might be, uh, should be aware of if they're mm-hmm. going to work with somebody with Parkinson's uh, sort of blindsided? I keep coming back to personal trainers because I know I, yeah. I get Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I consider myself the Parkinson's personal trainer because you just don't hear of it anywhere. No, no trainers are working with them or, or, you know, and if they are, you can see they're, they're just approaching them like, okay, here's an older person. And that's, that's so far from, you know, a a satisfactory approach. So yeah, we want to look at the environment and the safety of it. Look look at the floor, you know, we want to make sure they're not in an area where they can be tripping over weights or dumbbells, Uh, uneven surfaces, or look at the surface. Is this a surface that's slippery or is this a surface that's even just kind of slick? Um, What are we looking at? What's the color of the surface? Um, You know, to have, you know, an area that blends in with the steps and blends in with, you know, another area can be, you know, problematic. So I would say, you know, really looking at the environment and making sure it's conducive for someone uh, with, uh, with Parkinson's uh, and making sure that it, you know, that, that it fits for them because they really do get anxietous. uh, And, and it's something that I've always taken into account, even for my folks that don't have Parkinson's, but I take in everything. I look at music color of the walls and environment, uh, which I know at a gym, they can't control that. But but uh, we're looking at every possible thing you can think of, the temperature uh, of, of where they're working, uh, the noise level. All these things make a big difference because their concentration can be distracted uh, and they need to be able to hear you. You need to be able to hear them. Uh, for some folks, um, you know, they have the hyperphagia, which is the voice gets very soft and they're speaking, but as they speak, they're voice. Their voice goes down or it's hard to hear. And so you need to be in an environment where when you're communicating, you can hear them and you can hear what they're saying and vice versa. So interesting. I didn't, I never thought about the voice, um, but you brought up something else, the environment. We're, you're, you're in your own studio right now and I right. don't see behind you any mirrors. Would mirrors affect somebody, a theory of somebody has mm-hmm. Parkinson's by altering their perception and their balance? You know, it's interesting. I actually do have a mirror <laughs> uh, in, in here. Yeah. And that can be particularly helpful. Love the idea that there, there would be a mirror. Now, not so many mirrors that they're distracted and looking everywhere, but a mirror would be great because then we can begin to introduce conversation about posture. And this is posturally how we would like you to stand. This is posturally how we would like you to move. So the gentleman I mentioned uh, that that is now walking without a cane, one of the first things we went over was his his posture once he was able to stand and you know what's that look like and so the best way to implant in my opinion that file if you will is for him to see it so that it goes into that file cabinet called the memory bank and then he remembers and now with queuing we marry those together and i can say okay remember 
shoulders back and remember your stance for the proper base. And because he's seeing that in the mirror, that's what we, you know, that's what he's seeing in his head and it's helpful. So it's not an absolute must, but I think it's beneficial. And so, yeah, I like to see a mirror uh, somewhere where can have the folks take a look and see what they're doing. Are, are there any exercises that someone Parkinson's should avoid? That's a good question. Um, you know, it depends on what is, you know, what presents the person you're working with. So, you know, if you have someone that has issues with balance, uh, obviously there's some exercises like lunges and things like that. You're going to say, you know, I don't think we're going to try that here. Um, so it really depends on how the person presents. Um, some of the obvious things are, you know, obviously we're not here to have people lift super heavy weights. Uh, we're not here to have people do things that even on their best day, you know, at 15 years old, we would have said, don't do that. Uh, um, but yeah, so I, I think it's the obvious things, but it's, it's combined with where they're at. You know, there are five different stages to this disease. Obviously the la the latter of those stages being the worst. So, uh, taking into account what's at hand and, and who you have in front of you, I think dictates what you should or should not do. I mean, this is, you know, for so long, we've heard it in our industry, Joe, where, you know, they, they throw it around as a benefit. We custom design, you know, it's custom, it's tailored. Well, now it's no kit. It's no joke. You have to tailor it. You really, really do uh, in order for the person to derive the best benefit possible for the sake of safety and for the sake of efficacy of, of uh, the exercise experience. Do you have any advice for that person who may be listening to us or watching us right now who's got Parkinson's and saying, I, I don't know where to start, I don't know what to do? Um, where, what, what advice would you give that person? Sure, that's a great question. What I would advise is I would advise that they go to one of two, two places. Um, I would advise that they either go to their physical therapist because there are physical therapists that specialize in exercise for Parkinson's, it's always a great place to start. Uh, they can really speak to it intelligently and really specifically. Uh, now, not all physical therapists are aware of trainers like me that are out there that are available, but that is a wonderful place to start. I feel like it's a safe place to start. Other than that, then you have to begin to look online like some of the folks have that found me. Uh, and if you happen to find the right place, um, you know, you're, you're in luck. But I think finding the right place is finding a place uh, such as myself where they are interested in making sure that they educate you not only about the condition, but how exercise can impact it without worrying about selling you on participating in an exercise program them, with them which is exactly where I'm at. I try to, I try to speak to different groups. Uh, I let people, I let folks know when we do a consult, that's nothing more than just us getting together. I want to hear your story. I want to hear what's going on. I want to answer some of the questions that maybe came to you later on after you saw your doctor and now you can't get back in for six months and things like that. So I would say physical therapist and then look for resources uh, and uh, and definitely check out their credibility. You know, find out what they're doing. What what do you have behind you? You know what, you know, and, and you can tell very quickly, uh, especially when it comes to the exercise professional. If you speak to them, you just can't. There's there's too much to know to to fudge it. <laughs> so uh, you know, you, you can ask. Um, I I published a. Um, uh, a little blurb online that's abs absolutely free. It's uh, parkinsonsexercisechecklist.com, and it talks about all the uh, all the exercises, uh, not all of them, but a good number of exercises, and what the benefits would be. And that's kind of what you're looking for, you know. And it's when I first started out in this, what I liked was that, you know, there were different entities that you know really brought me on like down at Penn and they were fantastic you know they were like sure come on in you know you want to learn more that's great we're not trying to weed people out we're trying to get good people in that want to help and want to be part of this and so I think if you can find those opportunities you know that's great uh, but look, find places like that talk to them a lot of people in the fitness industry have pivoted to doing online training yeah is this a, 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 a good option for someone with Parkinson's to do it online, or do you prefer to actually be with them in person when you do this? My number one preference is always in person, always in person, um, because there are so many things that we're looking at, different uh, check downs, whether it's in posture, technique, form, um, cueing, uh, just, just 
really being able to have your your full attention on them and being able to reach out. You know, just being able to interact in person is always the best. I do I do have some high functioning folks that if need be, they can't make it or whatever, and something's happening. Um, we do do online. Um, it's not very many people. Um, and even with those folks, they, they know that, you know, let's get back to the preferences. We really need to be in person. Uh, that's where all the good stuff happens and where I believe it's the safest. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. It's definitely safer to be in person. I also, I'm, I'm glad you said you do have some who you may do like an online mm-hmm. consult with or some working with because yeah. I, I know I get I get people from all over the world who watch this podcast, listen to this podcast. Yeah, um, and so you're you're the go-to guy I think about when I think about Parkinson's and exercise. So yeah. you know, it, 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 I, I want to make it available if they're if they want to if they want to try to reach out to you because you're in Phoenix, sure. you know, in, yeah. in the Scottsdale area. Exactly. Uh, but there may be somebody in California who may be watching us or maybe in yeah, Canada. Yeah, exactly. You know, and so my, my, you know, right now I'm even having my main website redone because I want to make sure, and I tell folks this all the time, not everyone necessarily participates in a program with me. And I always try to make sure that they leave with a flavor in their mouth that they know that please count me as a resource. I don't need to be paid for it. If you need to call or you want to be in touch and you want to consult and find out and get information, I am more than happy to do that um, because I'm very passionate about this. So I do have that. I have um, I have a couple folks uh, that are from uh, Kansas City uh, that that I'm talking to right now. And that's what they said. They said, well, gee, you know, you, you sound wonderful, but we can't get to you. And I said, well, I can be an advisor for you, though. I can I can I can honestly talk to you about the exercises. And, and in some cases, you know, I do have video clips and things, but again, I tell them, you know, it should still be done in the presence of a professional. And if you can find one, great. If you can't try and get to a physical therapist, you know, and perhaps between the physical therapist and myself, we can, you know, begin to put together a program that we think is safe for you. If you're in that particular category of someone that can exercise, that's great. Uh, otherwise, um, I become more of a coach consultant, if you will, uh, from long distance, but I'm happy to do that. A lot of folks have a ton of questions and, and it's understandable, especially caregivers. And I enjoy talking to them equally as much, you know, with what are you feeling? What are you seeing? Uh, and understanding this. And, and we'll link to your, your website and uh, and any other information you want to give me. I'll link to it in the in the episode uh, for the podcast sure. and the video. Right. To this has been a lot of fun and, and it's Absolutely. been education as well because this is something... Again, I, I don't focus on it like you do. Uh, right. I, I think it's always good to have your niche. And yeah. uh, Parkinson's, you know, it's 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 in the periphery for me, but it's not something I'll, I'll spend hours a day, you know, for months or years looking at like oh, you have. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, no, I, I appreciate it. You're, you're absolutely making a difference in the lives of people who do need to have a difference made because, you know, yeah. I, I do think you're, you're, you're literally saving people's lives, which I think is phenomenal. And it's definitely, it's definitely something that I, I don't think a lot of people, at least in the fitness industry, really think about that much. They... I, I keep telling people, you know, you're, you're a member of the healthcare system, exercise is the most powerful medicine in the world, it does a whole right. bunch of things, right. um, but I sometimes don't think people get that message, and you're yeah. out there, and you are making a difference, um, right. and so... I'm I'm pleased that you're you're sharing your knowledge with yeah. people and and literally making a difference in the lives of, of of countless people around you know in your area, but I think also around the world now. The other people have have learned about this. Well, th- I appreciate you, Joe, taking an interest in it because I'll tell you one of my bottom line goals has been to to try and spread the word and and to really get more fitness professionals involved, um, wh- whether it's you know people in school that, you know, may want to kind of branch out and this is something they want to do, uh, internship, whatever the case may be. Uh, I am open to any trainer that wants to call and talk about it to see if they're interested in it, um, you know, without committing to it or find out more or whatever have you. Uh, we need more professionals doing this. Um, and, um, and believe me, you know, there's kind of two factions, classes and then one-on-one. And like anything, there are some people that are going to benefit you know, a lot more from classes and a lot of people are going to benefit from one-on-one. I have folks that are doing both. They're going to classes and they're seeing me. Um, but we need more, we need more fitness pros in, in this field. So I'm definitely, 
Yeah. What's your website again for people? Yeah, it's uh, joegreenfitness360.com is my main website. and I'm working on that one right now to revamp it. Uh, but then I also have uh, wemove-parkinsons.com uh, as the site that most folks find me on, which is just a real quick blurb. It talks about the benefits of exercise and uh, what I'm doing. Um, I work with a lot of people that have either been discharged from physical therapy for Parkinson's or have just simply heard about me and realized that they need to uh, exercise and make a day, make a change. All right. I'm going to link to both of those and uh, hopefully yeah. uh, we spread awareness about the benefits, amazing benefits of exercise in Parkinson's. Yeah. Cause again, as we said in the beginning, the, the results are nothing short of miraculous from what I have seen. And yeah. uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. There's, there's plenty of people to go around. My gosh, I think uh, the last statistic I heard was that there's a, uh, I think it's like 90,000 people uh, in the United States uh, are diagnosed with Parkinson's uh, every year. Um, it's phenomenal. And the number just keeps climbing. So, you know, it's, there's, there's, there's plenty. <laughs> um, I, I would be content with someone opening up, opening up down the street. That would be just fine. Uh, we, we need more people. Joe Green, appreciate your time and uh, your patience and your passion for this, which again um, is, is, is very, is very commendable.